Hello. <clears throat> well, this is the second time in two months that I've had to redo a session that was took place this morning in church in the library. But again, I forgot to click the record button. So this session is on the second Sunday in Advent. Uh, I'm going to try to remember the best I can a pretty lively discussion about Old Testament prophecies. Let me adjust the share to bring up the cover sheet for this conversation. This is the document that I sent to you titled December 10th, The Prophets Await Old Testament Prophecies. I used a question format or a teaching point format. And I thought it would be good to begin <clears throat> with, why did the Jews need a Messiah? Now, a simple answer is they need a Messiah for the same reason we do. We are all sinners. But it's complicated, and it becomes political in the case of the Jews. What exactly was going on in Israel? What calamity was um, taking place that required them to look for somebody who would rescue them uh, from such a calamity. The place to begin is to look quickly, and I don't want to make this the major part of this presentation, but if we look at the history of Israel, <clears throat> and I'm using a a document that I just pulled from the internet to find find this problem. Let me change it so you can see it in one on one screen. You're looking at the Old Testament story, and notice in the middle. I'll move my mouse in this in this area here. For about a hundred years, Israel had a combined kingdom. It was the highlight. It was the golden age of their power. David uh, unified the country, and his son Solomon followed. And so for a hundred years, there was a, um, a period of uh, Israeli dominance. It was considered their golden period. But notice after Solomon the picture splits. There is a uh, northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. They are called Israel and Judah. The northern kingdom ends up being conquered by the Assyrians, and later the temple in the southern kingdom is also destroyed I'll get to the temple in a minute, but the first problem is a series of kings of, over the northern and southern kingdom that led the people off into idol worship, basically violation of the, uh, the first commandment. Now, not only did you have bad Jewish kings who led the people astray, bringing God's punishment, that punishment took the form of a series of oppressors. The Assyrian Empire conquered, Jeru conquered uh, the country, both northern and southern, and ended up destroying the temple. The Assyrians were one oppressor. The Babylonians were another. By the end of the Babylonian conquest, there was no temple left in Jerusalem. The people of Jerusalem were taken away. The people of, of Judah were taken away in what's called the Babylonian exile. Now, uh, in addition, on this document, you can also see, look down here in this section, notice the names of the Old Testament prophets, Isaiah, Hezekiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Nehemiah. These are, these are books where 
Time after time, you'll see the story told that the people wandered away from God, worshipped other gods, and um, were punished because of this transgression. They would come back, some king would come along, and maybe he uh, put things right for a while. But if you read the stories in the first and second kings and first and second chronicles, you'll see a pendulum swinging back and forth between idol worship, punishment, and then restoration. But then the people would wander away again. Let me scroll this document now to the other page where the temple is described. Um, the temple in Jerusalem, really, there are two uh, considered. Notice the pink at the very bottom. It says first temple period. Solomon created the temple about 968 B.C., and it survived up until the Babylonian exile. There was a temple in Jerusalem. Even though they had all these problems with the kings, um, d d different kings leading them away to idol worship, for the most part, the temple survived. And then notice there's a gray section here during the Babylonian exile. There is no temple here for about 100 years. Then there's the interesting story of a king uh, in Persia called Cyrus, and he conquers uh, Babylon. And since Babylon was the oppressor of Israel, we have the story of Cyrus restoring the temple. Now, Cyrus was not a Jew. He was a Gentile. But he restored the temple in Jerusalem gave the money, resources, the people needed to build it. And so we have the second temple period. Now, the second temple is actually two different temples. They started with a smaller temple, and later it was renovated by what's referred to as the Herod Temple, the larger temple that was in place uh, during the time of Jesus Christ. Um. But my point for this discussion is, it's logical for a people who consider themselves the chosen people of God. You can look at this picture of the temple. The temple has completely been destroyed for 100 years. And only through the benefactor, benefactor uh, uh, of Cyrus was a temple created again in Jerusalem. The people could ask, what did we do wrong? What what? We must have transgressed God's commandments. He is not protecting us. And again, we can see that up here with the um, destructions and the conquering of the Syrians, the Babylonians, and then keep going, the conquering of, by the Greeks and the conquering by uh, the Romans. So here are people who consider themselves chosen by God. And they only had 100 years of combined, glor you know, glorified uh, kingdom. And ever since then, it's been bad king after bad king, oppressor after oppressor. And so it's logical to ask, will God send us a deliverer? Will a Messiah, to use the more norm the term we're familiar with, Will God send us a Messiah to reestablish an honorable kingdom, one where the Jews can be led by Jews uh, under the authority, of course, of God, God the King of all kings? But still, um, it, it's logical for them to look for a Messiah. And the Messiah they're looking for is definitely the conquering hero, the general on a white charger who's going to come and throw out the oppressors and make this situation right. It's a, um, it's a logical picture. And so we went looking, and I'm going to pull up that previous document again. Here is, here is the document where I list 
and I'm not going to read all of them, but I went for script to scripture and looked for the um, the genesis of this Messiah who will be a conquering hero type. Uh, if you go to the Old Testament, it's easy to find in Isaiah and Jeremiah um, places where the prophets tell the people, if you don't get your act together and return to God, there is going to be punishment. Let's read a little bit about this. I, I particularly like this one. In, chat, in, in Isaiah 1, verse 2 and 3 and 4 or 5, maybe, at least through 4. Um, Hear, O heavens, listen, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows, now look Look at how he's <laughs> calling the Jews worse than farm animals. The ox knows his master, the donkey his owner's manager, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Ah, sinful nation, a people loaded with guilt, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on them. Because of that behavior, by their kings and then by the people also, the Jews were uh, going to be punished. Uh, Jeremiah, from the north a disaster will be poured out on the land. All the peoples of the northern kingdom, their kings will come and set up their thrones at the entrances of Jerusalem. They will come against all our surrounding walls in the towns of Judah. I will pronounce my judgment on my people because of their wickedness in forsaking me, in burning incense to other gods and worshiping what their hands have made. So here's, there, those are two accounts where God, uh, the prophet, has said, it is because of your behavior, it's because you have worshipped other gods, wandered away from the true God, that you deserve punishment. Um, and so it's logical that they would look for a, um, a king to resolve that problem. I went looking for verses <clears throat> where we see that kind of a... Uh, hero king uh, described. Uh, for example, in the second psalm, we find, Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the end of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. Okay, an iron scepter. They're, they're, they're going to be in power. In Psalm 110, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So you've conquered your enemies, and they are now your footstool. That's a picture of victory, I would think. Now, one that we use around Christmas, <clears throat> but I'm going to use it here to describe this conquering hero. Look at Isaiah 9. Familiar words for us, because we use it in our worship. For to us a child is born. That's the part we think about for Christmas. To us a son is given, and here comes the power. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from time on forever. Now, we read that, and we think of Jesus. The Prince of Peace language, the child is born language, that, that, we connect that, and so we, we think of Jesus. But I can, I can see clearly how the Jews would read that as their kingdom will be reestablished, uh, and they will be in power with a king that is righteous. Um, further down, Isaiah 43 uh, no one can deliver out of my hand. When I act, who can reverse it? 
So those are there's my dog barking. I'm going to pause the boarding just for a moment. Maybe not. Maybe she's going to let me talk. Um, anyway, <clears throat> so my point is the Jews needed a political solution, and they looked for a great king who would resolve this problem. Now, let's move to the other side of it. We're, we're, we're Christians. We know that uh, we're looking for uh, prophecies that support the Christian Messiah, the suffering servant Messiah, who wasn't a general on a white charger, but instead came to die, the death on a cross. And so... Um, there's not there, there are more verses in the Old Testament that talk about a conquering Messiah, but there are significant verses where the suffering servant picture is provided. And if we go to Isaiah 53, and we noted in class this morning, this is sometimes referred to as the fifth gospel. Isaiah talks in terms here that we are very familiar with as Christians, the language, is, des is describing Jesus and his uh, suffering and death, and the purpose of that suffering and death uh, is a true gospel message. But let me, let me read Isaiah 53. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So notice the language here. In verse 5, he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. He is... <clears throat> That's substitutional atonement. He dies in our place. Um, and our iniquity, our sin, is placed on him on the cross. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We all have sinned and fallen short, Paul tells us. And Isaiah agrees. We have all sinned. We all have iniquity and need to be released Another, uh, some more language in the Old Testament that relates to this suffering servant story. And again, another very familiar words in Zechariah, uh, we find language that reminds us of the triumphal entry. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you. That's the king part. But now watch. Righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey the foal of a donkey. Jesus enters Jerusalem, not on a great white horse, but instead on a donkey, fulfilling this prophecy. Then there's a long one, and I'm not going to read all much of this at all, but I encourage you to read Psalm 22. From the cross, Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Notice that that's, verse, that's the first verse of Psalm 22. He is calling out using the words of this psalm. He doesn't say the whole psalm. He just calls out the first verse. I think, I think he was praying the psalm, and by bringing it to his mind, he didn't have to say the whole psalm. He just said the first few words, and it, he connects now, one thing he connects is the very end of the psalm. This psalm is very descriptive about the suffering servant and how his suffering uh, is significant, body and soul. But get down to the very bottom. Look at verse 30 and 31. The end of it now. We're at the end of Psalm 22. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, for he has done it. 
Now, that last clause, he has done it, is similar language. It is not exactly the same words. He says on the cross, it is finished. His work is done, he says. And here in Psalm 22, we see the same idea. The Lord has done it, past tense. It's done. It's finished. So I'm connecting those two things. Well, anyway, um, we we are more familiar with the verses that talk about Jesus suffering a death on the cross for us, and that's what's described here in the Old Testament. So the Old Testament has both kinds of prophecies, a conquering hero that will establish righteousness, and then a suffering servant who establishes righteousness in a completely different way by his substitutional death on the cross for us, taking the iniquity of our sins on his body and giving us his righteousness. Um, now, of course, the Jews don't agree with us about Jesus being that Messiah um, to this day, but that is how we look at this. Now, the documents I sent to my members of the class included another one where I went looking for the last, my last discussion point up here was prophecies fulfilled in Jesus Christ. How do we, how do we um, relate Jesus to prophecies in the Old Testament? So I'm going to change the share again and bring up <clears throat> this thing this would take a lot long time to go through, and so I'm I'm not going to, but notice the title at the top, Old Testament and New Testament Fulfillment. Uh, this is a list of 47 Old Testament verses that point to Jesus as Messiah, and they start with Genesis. In Genesis, we're told the Messiah would be born of a woman. Now, wait a minute. Everybody's born of a woman, right? Well, wait a minute. You need, you need Jesus to be a human being. It's true. All human beings are born of women. So, this is a prophecy of the Incarnation. The Messiah will come in, in a natural way, born of a woman. Now, it's not completely natural because the the Father is not Joseph. The Father is the Holy Spirit, who the word in Scripture is he overshadows Mary, and she gives birth to a son. Anyway, the fact that he's going to be born in Bethlehem, the fact that he's going to be born of a virgin. Now, the word virgin is a, is a little bit problematic. It's not clear whether the word virgin really means a woman who has never had sex or simply a young woman. Both are correct. Um, and uh, the Christian interpretation is that, that uh, Mary had not had intercourse before she gave birth to Jesus. Uh, Christianity is divided over whether she remained in that situation after Jesus was born, um, the Catholics say no, she was perpetually virgin. Um, and by the way, uh, our namesake, Martin Luther, believed in the perpetual virginity of Mary. Um, doesn't make a big deal of it, but it is, it is a fact. Um, then there's the idea that Jesus is going to come, he's going to be a Jew, so, he comes from the line of Abraham, or he comes from the line of Isaac, Abraham's son, or he comes from the line of Jacob, which is one of the, is the, 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 there's two sons of Isaac, remember Esau and Jacob fame. And then, one more, <laughs> uh, Jacob had 12 children, one of them was known as Judah, so he was going to come from the tribe of Judah. Uh, and all of that took place um, uh, through, through Jesus. Jesus is all of those things. 
um, his trip into Egypt when he was young. Remember the story about the uh, killing of the innocents in Bethlehem? Herod tries to destroy Jesus by killing all boys under two years old in Bethlehem. Uh, Jesus' family escapes to I Egypt for a time until Herod has expired. Um, the messenger who will prepare the way for uh, for the Messiah. We, we know that as John the ba Joe, know him as John the Baptist. Um, the Messiah would be rejected by his people. We could read in Psalm sixty nine and Isaiah fifty three about that. So there's a lot in here. As I said, I'm not going to go through all of them, but the fact that he would. Uh, not defend himself when he was betrayed. Money would be used to buy his betrayal. Um, the nature of his his death, his crucifixion, even the idea that he was given something to drink, the vinegar at the cross, all of this, it goes on and on. There's 47 of them. The Messiah's bones would not be broken. Remember the story in the crucifixion to speed up the death of the people hanging on the cross because Passover was approaching. The Jews asked the Romans, this is horrible to think about, but they wanted the Jews wanted the, the people off the cross because it would offend Passover. Think about it. that's pretty that's pretty awful. But anyway, so the solution is to break the legs of the Poor people hanging on the cross. If their legs are broken, they can't raise themselves up on the cross sufficiently so that they can take a breath. Hanging on that cross restricts your airflow. And so the way you did it, the way you breathed, was you stood up on the nails in your ankles. Think about how excruciating that would be so that you could breathe and then you would collapse again over and over and over again. But anyway, the Roman soldiers came with big hammers and they broke the legs of the two men that were next to Jesus. And then presumably then they would expire quickly because they were no longer able to breathe. But they came to Jesus and they said, well, he's already dead. We don't need to break his legs. But then one of them said, well, we'll prove it. And so he stuck the spear in Jesus' side. The spear was to replace the hammers. So technically it's true. His bones were not broken, but his, his body was pierced. The fact that he would be buried, that he would ascend, sit on the, God's right hand, these are all part of the prophecies. So this document explains where it is in the Old Testament and where it is in the New Testament that these things have happened. So that's the lesson for today. We, of course, believe that we do need a Messiah. Our sinful condition requires us to be rescued, and the rescue takes the form of a sacrificial death on the cross. His, his death frees us from the penalty of our sin, and... Um, makes it possible then for us to be have eternal life and to live with him in his eternal kingdom. So yes, he is a king. The com more complete story takes place in the at the end of the story in the book of Revelation and other places. We 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 talk about the end times and we are going to have a class on that. The last class of Advent that would be December 24th. We will look to the book of Revelation for some more discussion of, of how, how the incarnation is presented um, in the final, the uh, final times, the uh, second coming of Christ. So uh, that was it for today. I'm going to change the share one more time because our practice in the um, Faith Talk is to close with the Lord's Prayer, so I'm going to pray the Lord's Prayer to, to bring this to a close. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So, that ends this class. I apologize again <clears throat> for having to do another retake uh, to get this recorded. Um, we'll be in the library next week talking about New Testament. How did the apostles the, and also the gospel writers um, talk about the incarnation in relation to Jesus as the Messiah? And then, as I just said, uh, the fourth Sunday of Advent, we will be in the book of Revelation talking about the second coming of Christ. So thank you very much. I uh, hope to see you on Sunday. Bye now.